Today we have special guest Mark D. Valenti. Hey, Mark, how's it been been going, man? It's been going fantastic. I appreciate uh, being on the show, and I appreciate you calling out my middle initial because, as I often say, there's a Mark Valenti who writes children's shows for Nickelodeon, so don't exactly work on the same thing, but thanks for calling that out, Brian. Actually, it might be more fun to not call it out and let people from the <laughs> horror community reach out to him. <laughs> Look at IMDb. <laughs> Yes, yes. The uh, author of some of the Rugrats episodes might be happy to answer some of those questions. That's correct. <laughs> Hellraiser, Mark. No, no, no. no that's that's, that's that the other oh. Mark Valenti. <laughs> that's right. The Rugrats. Actually, that could be interesting. Actually, uh, yeah. He's probably got some really deep thoughts about uh, perverting he, he, and... He might. He may be feel like he's trapped and typecast into writing these stories. He may be looking to get out. You never know. That could be true. That could be true. Um, Brett Bryan, should you mention that Mark has a podcast? That's a yeah, I was actually yeah, go just about it. to yes. say, Mark, uh, tell us about <laughs> yourself. Uh. <laughs> I appreciate that, uh, that open-ended question. Uh, yeah, a couple things. My background is behavioral health and behavioral science. Uh, I've actually been in healthcare since 1994. Uh, a person who studies human behavior and, you know, that's kind of the semi-boring part, but it definitely plays a part in acting, which I'm sure people know. Uh, I've been involved with the indie horror community um, about almost two years, I'd say now, I think. Mm -hmm. And just that's, of course, how I met you, Brian, which I appreciated uh, that connection that we had. And uh, I have my own podcast called Brain Burrow, uh, B-U-R-R-O-W, which is really about digging deep in people's brains from a behavioral perspective to understand what makes people tick. So I appreciate the call out and the opportunity to introduce that as well. Yeah, uh, Mark, tell me. Uh, so I like, always want to ask everyone, uh, what would you say? Well, I know you love horror films, so we'll specifically make it about that. What sparked your interest in horror films? Like what what would you say is the thing that started your love? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, you know, I think uh, like a lot of people as a, as a kid, uh, horror films are kind of an escape, right? I mean, mm -hmm. if you're watching, and I remember the first horror film, the real the real horror film, besides, you know, Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein and, yeah. and all the old Universal Monsters movies, uh, was the original Alien movie. And I remember watching that on VHS back in the day, and I was, uh, I was terrified of it. You know, I was terrified of what could be creeping underneath. But what horror films do, of course, as you know, uh, when you're worried about whether or not uh, Ripley's going to escape the, uh, the xenomorph, mm -hmm. all of a sudden worrying about uh, homework doesn't really matter. Worrying about uh, is that bully going to beat you up doesn't matter. So I think focusing on horror films as a distraction uh, in that it, it, a safe distraction from real life uh, is definitely something that's always appealed to me. I, I definitely agree with that. Like, um, I always find it odd whenever people try to like be like oh watching horror like demence people and all this stuff and i'm like i think it's the opposite like everyone i've met in the horror community have been the nicest kindest people in the world so i think that people have got it backwards uh yeah, I, I thought you were gonna say that the horror fans were already demented <laughs> <laughs> well maybe, maybe we all are in our own special way it's very possible but yeah, I agree with you. You know, it's a nice distraction. Uh, I was actually in a conversation the other day with somebody about this and not only just horror films, but video games, first person shooters, you know, so it, you're you're uh, blowing things up or playing Grand Theft Auto. It could be a way to release tension, you know, release, release some of those uh, things that make us human. But as you know, to your point, a lot of people that don't understand it say, well, video games cause violence. Yeah. So I think it's the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um... What would what would you uh, so you you said that uh, Alien was the the one that really got you into it? So was that like the first horror that you really watched? Or yeah, it was the first one. I just yeah, the first you know R rated, R rated, uncut, you know, sort of intense. I mean, again, growing up, the you know black and white Universal. I'm not saying I wasn't scared as a kid, like a, a young kid watching some of that, but there's an appeal to it. I know there's a lot of discussions about. Um, people that are drawn to these things and you know they may watch i'm just listening to podcasts they were talking about beetlejuice i mean i was oh yeah like we're, we're talking years. about that on the next episode with uh oh, you are. L lydia manson oh yeah of course lydia yes yeah awesome well obviously yeah she has her own podcast and, and obviously is inspired by being herself strange and unusual as she says yeah but i think you know people that i find that are drawn to i think those elements peewee's big adventure speaking of tim burton right people that find themselves drawn to the strange and unusual uh a lot of times those are sort of gateway you know 
horror films as a way for people to say, I want yeah. more of this. So, um, yeah, so it's, it's interesting. So I always find myself drawn to, as I'm sure many, including both of you have found yourself drawn to those elements and maybe non horror films and then sort of keep exploring past that. Oh, and I was going to ask you, cause I'd never really hear you talk too much about other than horror, you know, movies. So like what other genres do you like outside of horror? Yeah, that's a great question. I'm a big fan of 1970s gritty dramas. You know, I love Dog Day Afternoon, uh, Taxi Driver, of course. Oh, yeah. My favorite movie of all time is One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Oh, that's and, great. I was in right? a, play, a play adaptation of that. Oh, you were? What part did you play? I, I played the same uh, part that uh, Scatman Crothers played. Oh, really? Okay, so like the... Uh, the uh, Waterly. The, the Waterly, that's right. Yeah. He like uh, let them in and everything else like that. Yeah. That's awesome. Wow, that's pretty cool. I didn't know that, Brian. Yeah, that was a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but I think all those 1970s dramas, it's really about the dialogue and just really, you know, and things didn't always turn out well. You know, when you, when you look at some of those movies, things didn't always have that happy ending in the end. And uh, I think I just find myself kind of drawn to those as well. Yeah, all great choices too. Like, I mean, like me, me and Jared both watch just about any type of movie. Like, pretty much. Uh, except yeah. I, I have some sort of thing against movies with too many puppets. Yeah. <laughs> like, what, what? <laughs> can you give an example? <laughs> not a big fan of Labyrinth or The Dark. Okay. Puppet. It's okay. We were doing an episode. We're, gonna we're doing a do an episode of The Labyrinth. I, yeah. Jeez. We're gonna break in one way or another. Yeah. <laughs> it's actually coming soon. So. <laughs> that's awesome. For, I love all these like uh, sort of sneak peeks of all these future topics. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. Even thinking about all this. So oh, does that mean awesome. you hated uh, Meet the Feebles? I actually haven't seen that, so I couldn't tell. Oh, you. Okay, I told him about it. He's like, it's Puppet Snow. <laughs> <laughs> but Jared, you're you're a fan of it. But it sounds I, like. But oddly enough, I love the Grim Gremlins. I love Gremlins. It's like one of my favorite movies of all time. So I don't. It doesn't make complete sense. I don't know. That's very interesting. I'm glad that you've uh, thought about this and, and sort of what your likes and dislikes are. So, uh, Mark, can you uh, delve a little bit more into your involvement with the indie horror community? Like what, yeah. what the whole process from, you know, when you first started till now? Yeah, great. Uh, thank you for that opportunity. It's, um, you know, like so many people that have been fans of horror, but maybe went down a different pathway. Like I said, healthcare has been my my pathway over the past almost three decades. Uh, and uh, with the pandemic, you know, starting in you know, 2020, uh, I found myself saying, okay, now I'm stuck working from home yeah. because I was used to teaching, you know, instructing in front of audiences, having meetings uh, where I live in Pittsburgh. And all of a sudden we're work from home. Okay, great. It's fantastic. But it kind of pulled me out of that interaction. And I saw randomly on Kickstarter an ad for a production company in Philadelphia that said, if you donate 300 bucks, you could help support our independent film and also be a background extra. And I'm like, I didn't even know this was a thing. Mm -hmm. And I know that there's, um, I think there's a split sort of opinion about those types of things. There's people that say, I'm a longtime actor and I should get paid for this. And again, I think you should because you've invested time and money in this and this is your career. So don't want to take that away. But there's other people who are saying, I'm interested in this. I want to support horror. I want to get close to horror. Yeah. And that was my that was my gateway into it. And I had a chance to um, work on a production in Philadelphia and get uh, introduced to uh, one of my close friends, Bianca Crespo, who's uh, also the producer of my Brain Burrow show. But it really just introduced me to it. And it, that's how I got my start. And since then, I've got connected to people, uh, directors uh, who said, hey, I like what you're doing. Uh, come audition for a new part or actually wrote a part for you. And it's just sort of uh, has been my entry, my gateway into the horror community. Um, yeah. So it's just, it started out like a lot of people is the crowdfunding and it's just the way to get there. So. Oh, and yeah. I, I wanted to tell you while I'm actually talking to you, well, I'm saying face to face, but you know, through video that uh, you remember the role that I had written for you on that one film and everything. I think you read part of it, didn't you? Yeah, I did. Yep. Like I'm going to repurpose that part uh, and put it in something different. Like a, I actually am going to be changing it because it was originally about pretty much zombies. And now it's going to be changed to like the same situation, same character, same everything. I'm just going to repurpose it into a uh, where it's the prostitutes in that scene are actually succubus, succubi. Oh, nice. So I'm going to repurpose it in that uh, method and put it in a short film. 
Well, that's fantastic. And Brian, thanks for that opportunity. And, and I know that you're a creative individual and you're always writing. And I think that that's great that you had an opportunity to repurpose and keep moving forward, keeping moving forward with that project. Yeah, so I thank mean, you for that. different project, but yeah. <laughs> right, right. With the, the idea behind it and sort of repurposing it. Exactly. So those, so. those were my those were my specific ideas away from what the producer was doing. So I'm like, eh, I'm not going to let him have my ideas. That's right. It's about create creative control, right? So it makes sense. So, but uh, yeah, um, I guess let's go ahead and dive into the Hellraiser. I was going to say dive deep in the Hellraiser. Yeah, let's dive deep in the Hellraiser. <laughs> let's dig deep. I love that phrase. That's great. <laughs> All right. So I, I guess let's start with uh, part one. Or no, wait, wait. Oh, let's start with why? Why what? Hellraiser. What do you mean why? Ooh, no. I love that. Actually, I'm I'm curious because I mean I'm I'm actually coming to this as uh, not really a fan of the Hellraiser movies, so I, I've constantly like tried to probe Brian's like why? What do you mean? Why do we like it so much? Or... Yeah, yeah. Like I mean, I, I I love pretty much all horror, and I don't hate the Hellraiser movies, but it's like I've noticed that there's people that that just love them, and it's like they've never like clicked for me like that. Hmm. That's thank you for sharing that. Do you know why specifically, or maybe what seems to be the the turnoff for you? I I think it's just a combination of things on it. Um, it's is it the uh, like uh, for example, like the Frank Kel character, how he's like this sexual deviant? Is that what it is, or it's a long way to say pervert? But... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, it, I think it has to do with the first one. It's 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 a very claustrophobic movie, and I think mm. just the idea of like Pinhead is this icon. I'm like, yeah, he's he reminds me of theater kids. Hmm. Uh, kind of like loftier uh, theater kids, whereas like Freddy's more of the insult comic, and I guess that's where it's like oh, I get this guy. Hmm. Well, I know for me personally, I see Pinhead as being more a grandiose Dracula type character. What 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 do you what about you? What's your appeal of uh, Pinhead? Yeah, no, thanks for for sharing that. And, and as you know, I like to ask a lot of questions myself, so I appreciate you kind of talking through that. And I, I like how Jared was talking about. And was it Jared or Jared, by the yeah, way? With a with a D. With a D, Jared. Thank you, by the way, because obviously I know Brian and, and Jared. I'm glad to meet you, by the way, by virtue of yeah. this podcast. I, I like. I think you, you kind of talked a lot about like what is it? You know, what are they symbolic? What do they represent to us? What do they represent for our own personal? likes and dislikes. I really like how you classified that. Uh, I think it's, um, you know, it's interesting. I've heard people say that they're not a fan of Pinhead using quote unquote, right? Because as we know, that's how, okay, so we'll probably talk about that's how he got his name sort of through, through on set. Uh, it, you know, some people may watch the series and expecting sort of this slasher, right? I mean, yeah. Jared's working, if you're listening, you know, Friday the 13th final chapter shirt, and it's not, which I'm a fan of, and I have a leather face, uh, you know, a shirt on now. So it's not sort of that traditional just slash and slash and slash. And I think maybe some people, uh, it's it's just a different type of character. And, and a lot of people may or may not classify the, at least the first two Hellraisers as a slasher film. and But yet he's often lumped in into that category. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's definitely true. And I was actually talking to him because we were watching three. I was telling him I'm not really a big fan of three because they changed Pinhead. And then he says, I actually like it three probably more. <laughs> Well, there you go. It fits right into that more of that genre, right? I guess we'll we'll get to that one. Yeah, yeah. So, let's start with Hellraiser. All right. One. So, uh, uh, to to me, uh, I think that the whole mythology, like even the beginning, where you're just seeing Frank solving the puzzle box and like that dark room, like all it, it for me, it captures me right from the beginning. Like, I. I love everything about the the mythology that's gotten set up. And have, have you read Hellbound Heart, Mark? I have not actually. Have well, you, Brian? Uh huh. Um, okay. For me, I, I like having read that. I also add a little bit of stuff from that because even that opening scene where he's mm -hmm. solving the box in the novel, it goes a little bit more in depth of what happens to him once he uh, solves the puzzle box, like. It's like his senses get super elevated. They're they're like mm. to the extreme. So his his hearing, he hears 
like a fly's wings flapping and it like almost busts his eardrums and you know very oh, wow. stuff like that so it's like everything's being elevated to the extreme which i find fascinated which obviously that's not in a movie but yeah right but it sounds like the it was uh the clive barker was very descriptive and sort of drew you in in, in connecting your own senses so it sounds like yeah, it's a and pretty, i actually read the novel pretty, after seeing the movies but yeah oh you did okay yeah. that's interesting as well then so um so you were able to at least make some of those connections and visualize what you saw in the movie along with your own, uh, you know, imagination, it sounds like. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, yeah, I think there's this, to your point, the mythology, I think the the score is amazing oh, as well. Yes. Right. Yeah. It just sort of pulls you in and this sort of, that you, you know, grandiose, I think is what the words you use. It's sort of this just orchestra, you know, there's an orchestra playing, right? It's this very grandiose music that pulls you in as well and um, i think that's that's incredible I, I think for me i think the first time whenever they went into um the house that of course uh julia and uh, and uh, oh my gosh yeah, they're moving into the house right and julia they find that frank had been living there and yeah. just like the griminess of like the mattress and the yeah. pictures and just ugh, like it's just i just remember really that scene being so visceral and thinking wow this is it's a little different than, you know, sort of these almost, not that it's clean, but you don't see this sort of griminess in other types of, of films that are sort of classified in like the slasher genre, even though, again, it isn't necessarily a slasher. Yeah. I, I also think that the acting level is elevated uh, uh, compared to a lot of other 80s slashers and stuff. Yeah, like. it, it is. It's, I guess the, the term I, I come back to, the theater kid thing, is like it does feel a bit more theatrical at times uh, more so than you know your run-of-the-mill slasher you know anything like that it's it's more heightened yeah that's actually a really great way of describing it it's um yeah even the scenes right when when um when julia i believe is just talking about uh, the way that they even talk right it seems that's a great way to describe it it's there it's like almost they're on stage in some of these set pieces yeah. i think in a way so i think that that's a good point that you're calling out which, I mean, that was, I guess, the, the thing um, for me most effective in the movie, which, I mean, like I said, it's like I'm not a huge fan. I don't dislike the first Hellraiser, but it's uh, it's very claustrophobic. And that was like the first thing that ever hit me about the movie. It's like this kind of thing. I guess I had an idea in my head because I saw it long after it came out um, that it would be, you know, much grander. And I realized watching it, it was like, this could be a play. Yeah. And yeah. watching how the, the movie flows it's almost like the camera's trying to squeeze through these spaces in this house and it's like this isn't like you know some gothic cemetery nothing happens there it's it's a house it's yeah set a grimy you know kind of run-of-the-mill house with just some gross elements to it yeah it's, it's a great call out i mean when i think about the attic right this this attic where where um you know frank is being reincarnate not reincarnate but he's he's you know coming back to his self it's just i mean i'm thinking like does anybody ever go up in that attic yeah. you know yeah it doesn't it, look it, like it <laughs> right exactly and it's it's like in this house and they're having dinner downstairs and and you know as he's sort of rebirthing and he's going up there and it's just like this very very grimy uh you know which draws you in but this area that is just it's just yeah the whole thing is just very visceral and i think that's what makes it effective and I guess it depends. I mean, I'm a huge fan of body horror movies, yeah. you know, so obviously, so I think there's that, maybe that's another element of that, this film that I, that I like perhaps as well as we're talking through this. Um, I, I find it kind of interesting too, just thinking about it. Cause when you were talking about the attic and everything, uh, I just remember the scene where the father gets cut and then, you know, the blood and just how bothered by the cut he was like, yes, with yes. an interesting contrast to the fact that, Basically, what's happened to uh, Frank is way beyond that by far. Right. And right. he's just like, oh, my God, you know, it's so horrible. And that's I right. find that interesting. That's right. That's a great call out, right? Because he's holding his hand and he just was looked like he was about to faint and he wanted wanted help. I think that was you're actually right from Julia specifically. I think that that's actually a really good call out. Yeah, a lot of contrast in this in this film, for sure. Agreed. And, you know, and then you have, of course, Julia going out and picking up all these guys and these yeah. guys are kind of you know they're thinking they're gonna get lucky and these are just like quote unquote regular guys who are just yeah. like okay this is great and, and, and you know and i remember just the first time i'd ever seen it just feeling really 
had for these guys, you know, not just that they're not going to score, but obviously that uh, they're just were genuinely their entire life or sucked out of them. Yeah, right. <laughs> they were they were generally scared. I mean, the acting, obviously, the actors did a great job of just expressing this fear and disgust and then realizing that's the end of them. I think that was just I remember that yeah. part, of course, hitting me the first time I saw it. And uh, the Julia character, just how deceptive she is overall is great. Like she's like. Like from from the point that she lives kind of a sham marriage with him for all these years, like right. clearly in love with Frank or in lust or whatever it happens to be. I'm thinking love. Um, she sure. uh, she lies to him, lies to these men that she's bringing in. She's just the ultimate deceptress. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. Yeah. It's now. It's, <laughs> it is now. I made it up. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that was pretty good, actually. Yeah, I think that's it. I think the first, I did not see it in the theaters. You know, I was 14 when it came out mm -hmm. and I just don't think I knew enough about it to even go see it. I saw it a few, a, few, a couple years later, actually. So, but I don't think the first time I saw it, I really appreciated the Julia character being almost like the main, you know, villain almost in, in a way in this meeting. Yeah. I mean, not as much as in the second one, but one of the antagonists there. Yeah. And, um, uh, the Frank character, of course, being like this ultimate sexual deviant, like he's just he's a sex addict. But I think that he's beyond that. I think that to a certain degree, he's I mean, not a rapist, but he's close. He's yeah, close. I mean, he's uh, actually Uncle, I, Uncle I guess Frank he is he with, uh, with Kirsty now that I think about it. So I guess maybe knocking him out of that category don't completely count. But yeah, yeah. I mean, he you know, it's that that famous line about uh you know, un Uncle Frank and, yeah. uh, you know, come to daddy and come all that other daddy. stuff. Yeah. That's right. So definitely very creepy yet, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Jared, what do you think? I see you laughing. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I was joking with uh, Brian earlier. It's like, it's like we, we can intro this as uh, Hellraiser is the heartwarming story of a pervert who uses a magic box to summon other perverts. And his yes, that's become the ultimate pervert. <laughs> <laughs> That may take the title of in introducing the word pervert into, uh, you know, ultimate uh, title, including that in the title. I think that's a great point. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's uh, you know, and I know a lot of people watching are probably aware that it's it's interesting how the Hell Priest, right, that's his official name is what, is well, what Pinhead's called. That's why Clive Barker calls him in the Scarlet Gospels, but I'm still going to call him Pinhead. Like, yeah, I, that's fine. Like, Just for yeah. that. Right. So, you know, how he has very little time in this movie. You know, he has the, the, the amount of screen time. I forget what the actual number is, but it's really, really low. And yet he became this iconic character as part of this. So I think that says a lot about maybe the mythos, maybe him being this sort of anti-slasher, maybe him being this mysterious figure. Even just his look was very, very, you know, interesting and kind of kind of cool, I think, too. It's yeah. just very, yeah, different. So he's definitely got like an SNM Nosferatu. Yeah thing going he's right. like different than pretty much any of your other iconic characters that kind of came from the 70s and 80s uh, that's it's right distinct yeah that's right he definitely is and i well, think and all he... of the cinnabites from the first movie like are interesting like my favorite of course being the the chatterer one the chatter yes yeah. yes is that your favorite why is that your favorite that's i, I don't know just because he's big and creepy looking i don't know it just <laughs> and his teeth are chattering i don't know it's unnerving i like yeah it, it it is unnerving. Yes, I agree. You know, and, and at least in the first one, his, you know, you can't see his eyes or anything like that as well. So, yeah, it, it's definitely very interesting. And of course, there's this whole, uh, it's been discussed many times already that they're not really evil or good. They're just yeah, explorers, right? They're just sort of. I, the way to... I worded it with Jared, it's like if you look at Pinhead in part one and two compared to three, and one and two, Pinhead's really just doing his job. Like his job is this, and he's doing his job. That's right. Exactly. And there's, there's, yeah, there's no sense of evil. He's able to, it doesn't matter, right? He's just after, to your point, doing his job and connecting with these people that are trying to explore the further reaches of their own flesh, basically. Yeah. Um, excuse me for a minute. I'll be right back. Okay. I'll continue the discussion. <laughs> uh, so, uh, like which, which would be your favorite Cenobite outside of, uh, pinhead obviously but yeah yeah i mean it's a great question you know i think um i don't know you know I, I, in the first movie specifically i think 
I, I was, I like chat, Chatterer as well. You know, I think, um, you know, obviously female quote unquote Cinnabite as well, I think was kind of an interesting design. Yeah. I was always fascinated by how her throat was open. And yet when they did her voice, she could, it was her, it was sort of just, you know, distorted as I obviously yeah, implying that, that, that was because, pretty cool. right. I thought that was actually really, really interesting as well that they did that. And even, um, what's your name when they switched in part two, of course, Barbie, wild took over as that role it was just yeah. slightly different design but i think it was it was just kind of an interesting character i think out of the first two at least um a friend of mine was bringing up the other day how how just how intelligent um Kirstie is as a final girl compared to yeah. some of the other final girls like like that she beats the cenobites using her brains like that's right and how fascinating that is. And and she not only did it in the first movie, she did it again in the second movie. That's right. Yeah. And, and they even, you know, Pinhead calls it out. It, it, you know, he said, it's not your skill at bargaining you're, we're interested in. You know, he basically calls her out and affirms her almost for her skill in that way. So that's a great, that's a great point, Brian, about um, her using her brain as a way to escape. Absolutely. Um, I, uh, I also like uh, Jared had brought up the whole, uh, you know, wearing the father's skin, like Frank wearing the father's skin thing. And I'm like, yes. that's fascinating. You don't really see. I mean, I guess you see it again years and years later in not a horror, but in uh, uh, Men in Black. Like, yeah. you know, but like, it's not <laughs> it's not something you see super often in movies. I don't think somebody just wearing yeah. somebody's skin like that. Yeah, I think that's a great point, right? Unlike, of course, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, House of a Thousand well, Corpses, all the other ones. That's but, a different method. I mean, that's different, like right? just it's, a mask. That's right. That's right. I'm it's, talking about like it, to it's, disguise yourself to look like that person. Well, that's what <laughs> I was going to say. Like, it's di it's different than sort of the traditional in real life. This is what would happen. I'm just doing this for whatever reason. It doesn't clearly look like the person. Mm -hmm. it, this is. I think Men in Black is a great uh, parallel to that. For that reason, yeah. you're taking over this person's identity. It's not just. You know, like you said, a mask of, of skin draped over your face. I, is what I, was, I agree with you is what I was going to say. And uh, Jared, did you like I, I don't think you, you said whether you like that aspect or didn't like that aspect. Which one was it? I mean, it's it's an interesting theme because it's in the both of the first two of. Uh, somebody who is uh, essentially. I guess for all intents and purposes, is just completely evil. Yeah. Uh, still, you know, the wolf in sheep's clothing. Right. Um, so I, I, and I was kind of surprised because up until about 45 minutes ago, I thought that Clive Barker wrote the second one as well. I was like, well, maybe that's something he likes to play with. And like, no, apparently. Well, looking it up, it says that he did. And I don't know if he had any hand in writing it or not, but it's not listed. So, um, hmm. But, uh, um, yeah, I, I, I find uh the hellraiser especially one and two specifically very interesting for all the psychological aspects they have which is another reason why i asked you specifically for hellraiser because i know that's your area like i it's just so interesting because like all these uh different characters clearly that became cenobites have different psychological vices i mean obviously we pinpointed frank not a cenobite but uh his vice being you know, sexual deviancy. Yeah. Well, that's a great call out, you know, and I think it always sort of, what I like about the, the films, at least the first two was they weren't necessarily, you know, saying that the vices are bad or good, right? Yeah. This is just where they are now, obviously, uh, you know, if we're talking about underage Kirstie and other, you know, yeah. that's obviously in you, but I'm, but in general, that desire to go after some vice or some addiction is not good or bad because this is somebody deciding to do that this themselves. And I think that's what I, again, I think, but Pinhead himself personifies not evil, not good. This is just exploration. So I think that's a great theme. Um, yeah, I, th I think that that's a great point. So I don't know if we're going into the second one since, since you mentioned yeah, this, or I don't know. Let's go ahead and move into the second one. Yeah. Uh, yes. So, so what were your initial thoughts on that? And I want to hear Jared's as well, since obviously so, you weren't a fan of the series. So go ahead. To me, the most interesting addition to the, the second one that just comes right in my head is the little girl that's just great at solving puzzles. Like, I, I think that's so interesting because she's clearly not solving it for her selfish reasons. She's doing it out of this 
sort of like she just can't help but solve these it's puzzles. It's puzzle. it's, but I mean, yeah. it's, I guess it feel, fills that uh, falls in with uh, the other themes of like, like, like you said, addiction, uh, which seems to be like you know the overlying theme yeah. of the first two movies is that you know addicts kind of getting a really heavy dose of whatever it is they're after. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great call out, right? They say addiction, it's considered addiction if your pursuit of this specific experience or this substance or whatever gets in the way of your regular life, right? You can drink alcohol, but if I'm drinking and then I'm like, Brian, it's like 930, I'm so drunk, I can't be on the show, then it's an addiction because it's interfering with, you know, what I want to do. And so it's, I'm actually, good call out, Jared. So the question is, is Tiffany, I think her name is, is her compulsion to do these a specific addiction or is it her way of life? I don't know. Because whenever Pinhead shows up later, uh, you know, if you remember, he, he said, it's not hands that call us, it's desire. Yeah. yeah. And, right. and I, I did think that was interesting because it's like, you know, that that character is kind of presented as like a obsessive compulsive, maybe, you know, somewhere on the autism spectrum. And it's like, it's a compulsion, not an actual, like, yeah. there's no emotional attachment to what she's doing. Right. Great call out. That's yeah. So I think that's, that's a fascinating way to look at it uh, again. And then it's interesting, right? Cause then you think about in the first one, Kirsty solves the box. Does she have some underlying emotional addictive, you know, reason for doing it? Uh, it, but if it's just, for instance, just experimenting with it and there's no addiction level, then then it's a different rule for part two. But, so the question I is, is think that Kirstie had some desire because clearly they want her. Hmm. The Cenobites want Kirstie. Yeah. Great point. Maybe actually, not to the point of the other people. But yeah, that's a, that's yeah. actually a really good point. I, I tend to agree with that as opposed to inconsistent rules from Hellraiser one to Hellraiser two. I think that's actually a really good point. So, yes. Uh, another great addition to part two is that the doctor character is clearly has this fascination with hell and everything. And he's trying to clearly, I mean, going back to the girl, trying yeah. to explore it without the dangers because he's using her. Which that's right. Don't work out in his favor, but that's what he's trying. <laughs> his addiction is power. Yeah, I mean, it is. Yeah, great point. Well, right, because he uses everybody around him, right? From the the inmate that's uh, that he uses, the patient that he uses and takes back and based and gives the razor blades and has them cut. cut. It's very almost like a scientific anthro, you know, logical approach where he's, to your point, he's not really involved with it. He's doing it in a safe way. He's experimenting. He's behind the glass. He's behind the walls. He's there. So yes, it's very almost sterile as a way to try to have other people experiment as he does this. It's, I could see him like taking notes, you know, and saying, okay, if this, if this patient didn't work out, let's say the one that, you know, first time he tried it, he raised Julia. If it didn't work, I could see him taking notes and saying, okay, let's try a different patient with a different, yeah. you know, mental illness and see what happens. So great, great call out. He's very detached in a way. And I also feel like Julia, again, being this, you know, manipulator, she manipulated the heck out of that doctor when she came. Yeah, back. yeah, absolutely. It, it's it's definitely um, you know she used her seductive qualities or whatever the word you see used before, uh, uh, Brian. Tetris. To... Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I don't know. I might have to look it up and see if that is actually a word. I doubt it. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> well, well, yeah, exactly. And I, I think like she used that that and every other way to try to connect with him. She appealed to his sense of power. To your point, and just um, yeah, she definitely. Definitely did that up until the end of the encounter with him. And, uh, you know, obviously I'm assuming we've already done spoiler alerts and she has not, didn't hesitate at all. And to push him into that, uh, you know, mechanism there. Yeah. Bye. Um, I, I also think another addition to this movie that's interesting is the, uh, information that the Cenobites were originally human. Yeah. Great point, right? Because Doug Bradley obviously played part of the movie uh, as as the uh, you know the officer you know in in the uh, military there. So that's a great point. In addition to 
you know, the chatterer. I mean, what did you think about that whenever they're reveal of the chatterer or who he really was? Yeah. But like, so, I mean, like I always, I'm trying to figure out exactly how old he was supposed to be. I'm assuming like maybe middle school age, something like maybe, that. Yeah. Yeah. It was kind of disturbing in a lot of ways. Yeah. But what were your thoughts? I mean, since he's a fan, you're a fan of it. I mean, what, Kyle, what were your thoughts? Not Kyle. Brian, I wrote Kyle down because that's the orderly. That's the, that's the guy that works in the hospital, the other doctor. But Brian, what were your thoughts about it when it was revealed that Chatterer was a kid and that I, I wanted to get was, I thought it was neat because you I mean, just watching the first movie, you would mm-hmm. have never assumed that that character being as big as he is, like and as intimidate that it was a child. Like it just so to me that was kind of fascinating. And then you're like, Oh my god, you know, that they'll take and turn a child into this instrument of well, I don't want to say evil, but like torture and pleasure torture i don't know what you call it <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, yeah it's definitely crosses some you know mind uh, lines in our mind for sure uh, jared what did you think about the reveal of the cenobites being people at some point well actually that was uh weird because i, I kind of even in the first one i kind of just assumed that uh, that's mm. what they were um because i mean to me i guess in the going even back to the first one it's like i kind of felt that's what they were going to turn frank into it at some point Hmm. well i always took it that like only i mean i could be wrong this is just my own personal opinion i took it that only select few solve the puzzle in just the right way because i guess it has to determine by their own desires what their desires are whether they solve it in a certain way but the only these select few become cinebites is kind of what i was getting at yeah yeah, I mean, that would make sense, right? When you think about Frank's fate in this movie, which, of course, he's in that hell of his own, right? With yeah, the uh, writhing. Watch these women that he can't touch. That's right, exactly. So, which isn't exactly the same fate that the uh, the Cenobites have. So, I think that kind of aligns with your theory that uh, it seems like there were some very specific things that have to happen for Cenobites to become Cenobites. Yeah. And um, I also, I'm questioning like when the doctor becomes what he is, I'm like, do we count that as a Cenobite or is he something different or is he a Cenobite? I mean, clearly he's more powerful because he took out the rest of the Cenobites fairly easily. Right. I'm like, is he something different? Like it doesn't really explain, but I mean, I kind of lean towards like he was addicted to power and that's what he got. That's a, that's a fair uh, assessment. I think. I mean, he's a yeah. monster, but I mean, he got the power that he was looking for. Yeah, I think that that's, that, that's definitely a good call out. I mean, and obviously we'll never know, right? Because the timing of the Cenobites finding out at that moment that they were actually human made them vulnerable, right? I think, you know, you wonder if they weren't in that state and Pinhead was believing that he's always been, as he's, yeah. as he, you know, would they have been able to defeat Dr. Shenard or not? I don't know. And I do think that's uh, that's an interesting element that that they all believe that they've always been. Like I think that's right. so fascinating. That's and right, also, exactly. And like because they don't explore it too much. I also wonder. So in their dimension or what you know the labyrinth or whatever is does time work the same way? Is it different? Like that's something that I think about. Yeah, so absolutely. Maybe he right. has always, or at least seemingly always been. You know. That's right. That's right. It's a great call out. We, we, we don't know for sure. I think that's that's true. Well, it's also interesting, too, right? Whenever Dr. Chenard turns into the originally when he comes out, you know, and he's what do you say is uh, to think I, I hesitated. Right. Yeah. He's like that. Yeah. And all of a sudden this thing comes down and, and grabs his head. Now, is that symbolic that it kind of can, stops him from having the ultimate power because he's well, kind of controlled by this thing? I was wondering yeah. if that thing co- connects him. uh Let's see. They call the uh, the box in the sky, or the you know the configuration uh, of the sky, of Leviathan. Leviathan. So I'm wondering yeah. if that means he's directly connected to Leviathan, whereas the rest of them aren't. Yeah, maybe. I mean, that's that's great. I mean, there's so much, there's so much um, about this film that you know, it, which I actually like because if it were today, it would be. And here's exactly this: there'd be so much exposition, which I think would take away from sort of the I, mystery. I hate it. when people o- overly use exposition. Like, Agreed. I, I, to, to me. And I, and I don't want to insult people, but I guess they take it how they want to. I think it's a sign of a weak writer overly using exposition. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think it's um, it's it's actually a really good point. I think it's 
I just saw an assessment recently of Raiders of the Lost Ark, and uh, in the beginning, uh, when Indiana Jones, of course, you know, goes into the temple, you know, most of the time without even saying anything. It's like the the idea behind it is is that you can tell so much about him as an individual without actually explaining. Indiana Jones, you know, didn't always trust his instincts, and you know what? Like, it, yeah, it was like you learn so much just from not really explaining everything. And I, I think it's more interesting in in a film to uh, show, don't tell. Right, agree. I totally agree with you. Um, um, yeah. I'm trying to think of any specific things in part two. Is there anything in part two that we haven't talked about that you want to cover, or you? No, I think I, I think it's kind of funny, but um, I mentioned Kyle specifically. Of course, it's the same character. And oh. I can't remember his name. The actor who played um, he was what is his name Gorman, I think, in the Alien Aliens uh, movie. Uh, I think he actually was a, a very effective partner, right? He wasn't, he's, you know, he, although, yeah, he snuck into Shenard's place, he got out of there. Like, he was very, yeah. like, he believed, he believed Kirsty right away without actually doing anything. So I just want to call him out as Which somebody who was, like, yeah. you don't see that a whole lot. That's right. It's such a minor thing, but it's just something that I'm like, oh, yeah, all right. So this guy actually seems to be reasonable and is pretty much believing it after he saw it as opposed to some big thing. So that's, just a minor thing that's not really directed to the, the rest of the story, but that's just just a minor comment. No, I I actually like like that. I won't even I won't even thinking about that. But you're right; he believed it right away. Yeah, yeah, it was it was refreshing actually. Um, I don't think anything else. I think was this. I think this was the one. And obviously, these the events happened right after each other. So I want to make sure I'm not blending them together. Was this the one where they had cursed in the hospital and the chatterer? To, when he grabs her, he puts his two fingers in her. Is, I, be- her... I believe that's the one. I mean, it could have happened in part one. I'm not sure. I don't remember now. But it was just, again, it goes with just like, it just takes the Actually, sort of I do, tr- th- I do think it was it was this one, the more I think about it. But yeah, I'm not 100%. I remember. Yeah, I don't remember specifically. And I've seen them so many times, Me by too. the way. So, if, so I don't remember. So. I think a lot of times when you watch horror franchises, sometimes certain ones will bleed together and you have to double think did that happen in that one or did it happen in that one? that's that's right exactly but i remember that scene and thinking ah this is like you know just a little bit on the you know obviously um yeah. the grimy but yet sexual side that goes beyond what i think maybe traditional uh, other s- traditional other slashers and i'm not including things like maniac the original maniac and things like that but i mean more the or the quote-unquote mainstream and maniac, slasher oddly ones. enough as much as i love slashers and horrors i was watching that and i'm like i can't get into maniac Oh really? Interesting. Yeah, I, okay. I have a very difficult time watching that movie. It's a very, it's not a feel good movie. It's a very uncomfortable yeah. movie. It's it's a bad that. movie. <laughs> yes, exactly. Jared, have you seen Maniac? Yes, I've seen Maniac. I've seen the remake as well with Elijah Wood. Oh yeah, right, right. I haven't seen the remake. You'd probably like the remake a bit better. It's still not an uplifting movie, but right, it's more cinematic. Then, uh, and I think that's probably the element that you're really to watch like, the first one is that it is so maybe just back. how gross the guy is, yeah, tur- yeah, turns me yeah. off from it, yeah, yeah. I mean, he's they do lots of close ups of his sweaty yeah. face, and it's just, yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm Again, I can't say I love the movie in the way because it's not a feel-good movie, but I really appreciate and I've grown to appreciate well, what they've done in, in that it, film. It's so. kind of weird that I'm saying that's what got me off or not liking that where because I'm like, yeah, because he's so sweaty and gross. And then I'm like always joking that Jallo killers are sweaty and gross, but I love Jallo. So I don't right. – Well, usually it's just one scene where they have – Yeah, it's just one scene. Else. You're right. Right. <laughs> right. As a, right. As opposed to going really inside um, the maniac's <laughs> mind. But anyway, so yeah. So I think so, – no, I think I – think, yeah. Good. What were you gonna say? Uh, I was gonna ask Jared if he had anything else to say about part two or anything to bring up. Oh no, <laughs> I'm already ready for part three. <laughs> All right, so let's let's talk about the Motorhead song uh, Hellraiser. <laughs> it's, it's like the eighth best Motorhead song of that year. Because <laughs> I, I I absolutely love that song. <laughs> <laughs> well, but obviously you have different opinions on the on the Hellraiser three though movie. Yeah, Brian. yeah I do like. I, the more I watch it, the more I grow to like it. But I, it is of the first four my least favorite, which I hadn't seen it until very recently. And, and I've heard for years, Brian was like, "Oh, I hate it, hate it." And it was a friend of ours, uh, who was on an early episode, Chris Vanderbilt. Oh yeah, he loves it. He, he loves it too. And I'm like, "Well, what's wrong with it?" And he's like, "I don't know." They turn. He showed me some clips. 
And I was like, all right, well, since we're going to be talking about at least the first four, let's, I, I definitely need to watch these two. And uh, I watched it and I felt bad at the end. I was like, oh, God, I like this one best. <laughs> I, mean, I, I recognize it's like this has like none of the care, none of the love, none of the, the, the artistry of the first two. But it's like it's like it is so over the top and kind of stupid that it's. <laughs> yeah. Uh, one thing I will say is they got the highest body count in this one for sure. Yeah, with the with the the club, of course, you know, and getting mass uh, murder there, absolutely. It's a good call up. Way to focus on the positive, Brian. It makes sense. <laughs> so. I, I I think the whole time we were watching it, I was complaining about how much I hate the dude that like brings Pinhead back. And I, I, I oh kept, yeah, I kept laughing every time that dude showed. Because I was like, if they would have only casted Billy Zane, I would have liked him, but they didn't cast <laughs> Billy Zane, so I hate the character. And right, that's right. Him, like, he was like, what what if Frank were somehow sleazier? <laughs> Yeah, that's that's basically what it is. A very sleazy, which I always get the idea that Frank's a tough guy. This guy strikes me as being like just all around like he's got a steroid dealer. This is the kind of guy that's got a steroid dealer. He's, wow. he's, he's not going to compete in any type of sport. He just likes steroids. <laughs> Yeah, I think I, I like the comparison to Frank, though, right? Because Frank seemed very purposeful and he seemed very dedicated to uncovering the mysteries of the of the next step of, you know, this uh, addiction he has. He's to, whereas this guy just happened to fall into to pin, yeah. you know, the whole the whole thing. I think it's just, yeah, he's he's not as much of a complex character. That's, that's, so it's, that's pretty much the whole movie. It's like all the characters are. Uh, they're all idiots. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And even more than most most movies, like I'm always bad with names, but like I feel like in this movie, I don't know any of the characters' names. <laughs> no, yeah. the, the one guy's name was like JD or something. Oh, well, like yeah. The girl, was her name Joey? Yeah. Okay, so I remember that. <laughs> and then the other girl who also like really dumb. Right, who was the None of the girl. characters from the first two came off as like, unintelligent or non-purposeful they just uh i i did like the part where that other girl you were talking about uh where pinhead like basically was offering her you know it's like you know i'll give you everything you ever wanted or whatever like i thought that right. was neat. yeah i think it was that appealing right to somebody's um desires and maybe a quick fix to get out of and it could be associated with addiction right you're you're struggling with everything you're struggling with here's kind of a quick fix and easy yeah. choice to get out of here which you know, again, people who are addicted to substances, it's a way to escape the reality of what's going on around them. So perhaps that's a good call out as well. I, I like that. Yeah, I would I would say the first time I saw this movie, I didn't like it for the reason, Brian, you said, which is like, okay, they made him into this Freddy Krueger type of yes. character, right? Uh, you know, of course, when he's in the in the church specifically, he has a lot of these one liners, you know, and which, it's so from the church. There is one part I always like, which is the part where he does. Yeah, the symbolism, right? Yeah. Of the, the crucifixion. Yeah, Maybe that was not that what was he's saying, but what he does. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was definitely a very cool imagery, you know. And I, but, and this is so the the as I've watched it, I haven't seen it probably in a few years now, but and it's not, I'm embarrassed to say this, when I watched it this most recent time years ago, I just got that he split into two personalities. Yeah, like, that was something I was talking to Jared about. I'm like, the only way I can forgive it is that they took his human side away from him. So he's that's not right. Even the so same he's pure. Being. Which right. So he's. I guess to me, like seeing him like so close together, and this one for the first time, I'm like, oh, that makes sense. This is a different movie because this is Pinhead. You know, he's completely unleashed. There's no tether to him. He's just just the demon side. No human. He's side. just pure chaos at this point. Yeah, that's right. And and again, I think I was reacting and, and missed that part of the, the th first time I saw it, like, oh, they're just making him this. And yes, I get that there's an entity of him and his human side, but I didn't realize how split into these almost pure entities yeah. they were. So in looking at it through that lens years ago, I'm like, to your point, Brian, it could be forgiven almost that this is the way they did it. Do I like it compared to this first two? No. Or the fourth one? I'm with, I'm with you, Brian. I like the first two and the fourth one the, the best. Um, but yeah, that, I think I could, once I looked at it through that lens, I think I was more accepting of what they were trying to do. Yeah. And I actually do think I saw one, two and four before I saw three. So that also helped okay. the picture that way too. Cause it's like more of a jolt to me. Like, I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> it's, it's, it's ridiculously different. So, I mean, like I, I, I get it. Like why you hated it or hated it 
or at least sticks out like a sword. Which I'm, I'm definitely getting to where I like it more. Like I, yeah. I really don't like the, um, the protagonist as much as I like Kirsty. Like I really love Kirsty. I'll, I'll right. agree to that too. I, yeah, I don't think it's the actress or the way the character is written. I think it's the way she was written because I don't think it's anything with the acting. I think it's the writing. I mean, I could be wrong, but I, it just seems to me <laughs> like uh, like she was playing it the way it was written. It's kind of what I got from it. Yeah, yeah. It's just I think Jared, you said it best. There wasn't didn't seem to be the same amount of care that was put into this one versus the oh, first right. two. This was clearly like you know the first two were you know a success on their own scale, and this was. I think like, hey, let's let's vault this to, you know, Freddy Jason territory. So we're going right. to essentially, you know, dumb it down for, <laughs> for for audiences and see if we can get some more people in here. Uh, That's right. Or maybe yeah. it's a, a specific audience, you know, the I guess the lack of a better term, like the heavy metal crowd, you know, you got the, the motorhead theme, you got you <laughs> know, the concert venue. That's right. Uh, kind of playing the counterculture uh the way they had embraced pinhead as kind of just an icon at that point yeah i i think that's a great assessment of that i i totally agree and i think i want to ask what y'all think of the the new cenobites that were created i was just thinking about that i they're more uh they're more gimmick. over the top more gimmick, gimmick based, yeah. more almost almost borderline comedy yeah yes yes they, they felt like something out of like robocop 2 I love yes. RoboCop too. I love RoboCop too. It's like uh, it's like I'm throwing CDs. It's like I've, I've got the camera head. That's right. The, the, the CD yeah. one, especially, and, and actually the camera head kill, where it's like ready for your close up. <laughs> that's right. Right. These yeah. like, one line. These one liners. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a great call out, and, and just the C. Yeah, I think that's what it was. Gimmicky is a great word to say it, right? There was the it was the CD CD head, camera head, and then the uh, guy that made drinks, and he was wrapped in barbed wire, I believe, and he blew fire out of his mouth. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I agree. I agree. It was definitely yeah. Uh, see, I, I was I was getting back to uh, this is okay. And now as we're talking about, it, I'm not sure I like it as much now as we can start <laughs> reflecting on it. So I don't. Yeah, I'm glad I don't. You feel it for you, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. It's all right. I'm like I'm, I had it. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> for so long i demonized it then i'm starting to romanticize it and now i'm back to that so demonizing it so thanks it's a good conversation <laughs> um, i do like uh the further exploration of the human side of pinhead well you know in this movie that was something i always liked yeah agreed i think that's 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 actually a really good call out for that it really made him i mean he again doug bradley did a great job of really personifying that so good call out. Um, to say something bad again I don't like that they kept going back to uh, uh, Joey's father's, like her having a flashback of her father's death, which she wouldn't have witnessed. I was trying to, to do and, the math on that. And, and like, then like it really not having any impact on the rest of the movie whatsoever. It's just there, I guess, just give her yeah. some background. I don't know. Yeah, that's a great call. It And if we didn't connect with her, you know, like we connected with Kirsty for the other reasons, I mean, this is just, do we really care anyway, yeah, exactly. I guess? Right. Right. I mean, so. I, in my mind, the only thing that works about that is you see, you know, human pinhead in a military outfit and then you're in, in this war. And I'm like, OK, so right. maybe there's like you look at too deep. I'm movies. looking too deep. I'm trying. I'm trying. I'm trying to save this movie. Uh, that's right. It's <laughs> okay. It's all right. It's all right. The popcorn <laughs> movie. Right. And that is, right. Uh, yes, that's a fair way of saying it. So I, I have nothing else to comment on it. But uh, if you do, if either of you I, do, I please. Think uh, that I've said everything. Is there anything you want to? There's a Motorhead song in it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah Motorhead's great. Uh, yeah. Uh, there, yeah there you go. And uh, I think to an extent, I think I enjoyed it because I'm not as huge a fan of the first two and then. It being such a bizarre 180, it was. I have a weird love of the uh, these oddball sequels that mm-hmm. you know, uh, Nightmare on Elm Street two, Friday uh, yeah. Thirteenth Part Five, where it's not even Jason, uh, right, you know, right, um, Halloween three, where it doesn't fit with the rest of the franchise in any way. But all the other ones you named, I like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's actually a really good call out. Um, Halloween three is one of my favorites, uh, just because of that movie. Right. Me too. Me too. Um, I like Friday the 13th part two. I do not like, I'm not, I'm sorry. I like Nightmare on Elm Street part two. I'm not a big fan of new beginning Friday the 13th part five. I just can't get into it. With new beginning, like, and I'm, we're not going to dive 
you know, too deep. No, no. It. I, mean, I would just keep wanting to say dig deep, Mark. I don't know why. No, I, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> but, uh, it's fine. A- anyway, uh, like, I think the first time or two I watched that, or maybe even a few times I watched it, I didn't like it. But then it's like, now it's become one of my favorite ones, part five. Oh, interesting. Like, I actually think it has some of the more interesting kills. Um, I agree with that. Like that, that, uh, well, I was about to say that, Jason. Uh, Roy. <laughs> Roy, yes. <laughs> now nobody is going to be surprised. Uh, they, they uh, could have watched it. Um, <laughs> like, uh, you know, he had the first, like, wall burst in this. Oh, yeah, it's fantastic. Mm. Yeah. Like, yeah. I, know, I, I, I like it a lot. Like, I, it's one of my favorites of the series. So I guess in the subsection where we talk about New Beginning, um, it's definitely got the most unique vibe of the entire Friday 13th franchise. It's kind of exploitative uh mm. it's sleazy i think the director was like known for at least softcore pornography oh, oh I, really i, I didn't know, know that uh, well, <laughs> just watch the movie you can tell. Uh, but it's, everything there is just so over the top and it's like yeah i'm here for this this is fine <laughs> well I, I like the theme here right which is just if you take it as it is for either halloween 3 or friday the 13th part, part 5 or nightmare on street part 2 or Hellraiser Part Three, then maybe it's okay to appreciate it for what it is. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I mean, unless it's Hellraiser Part Three, then appreciating it for no, I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, I was getting back on board again, but I guess not anymore. So it's no, okay. I mean, I, I I can enjoy it, but like it's almost like I have to 100 percent separate it from the other just, Hellraiser. Yeah. Separate it as the oddball. Yeah. And and you're okay because they That's get right. kind of back on track in the next one. Yeah. Well, right. part, part four. I actually love a lot, with the exception. I think I've even mentioned it to you, Mark. I yeah. think the space stuff is like, I'm like, why? Well, why did we have to bring Pinhead to space? <laughs> yeah, I, it, it's interesting. I also love part four uh, for just the different elements. I didn't mind the space stuff as much because I feel like they were enough time jumps from – you know, where they were and then modern day and then the future. So maybe it didn't bother, maybe it didn't bother me as much. I just wonder why, why Brian had bothered you so much. Cause it's pinhead in space. <laughs> <laughs> so, that's all you, all you need to say. Uh, I mean, I guess. But honestly, all, all those um, horror franchises, it's like, those are the times when, you know, they're running out of ideas. It's like <laughs> they're going, to, they're going to the hood. They're going to space. Uh, space like what are some of the other ones? Like I, I don't know. It's like, well, some of them they have like prequels where they go back in time and get like, yeah, I'm like, it is in the old West or colonial days. Yeah, there are. The Ginger like, Snaps did that. Well, I actually like the Ginger Snaps ones when they uh, did that, though. That Trimmers was really did good. that in one of like, four, yeah, whatever, four or five. Uh, you know, go back to the untold story. You know, the, these kind of yeah. cults with these sequels when you start running out of a. Uh, but I, I will ideas. say at least the space section was only the very beginning for a couple of right. minutes at the very end. Yeah, I mean, that's right. That, I mean, that's fair. Yeah, I, I, I guess I didn't mind it as much because it was part of the element of the storytelling, right? It was, he didn't have what merchant, right? Well, I can remember his first name. Technology, but it, like, basically, to make what he was, right, yeah. Right, right. It was like in the past, he had the drawing, and then in the middle of it, you know, in the, in the current day, he had it in this building, and then in the future, he had it. So, I mean, yeah. to me, it sort of worked for the story, but I could see why somebody I maybe still turned think off. They could have, like, like had it been like, oh well, modern day we have this technology that that's we could do this stuff. Yeah. Okay, that's fair. So you would think that modern day was the third timeline, and then, then you'd go back and okay, like, yeah, you know, something like, like that. Yeah, I mean, I'm not married to the space idea. I just, I didn't, I wasn't. Uh, it was okay. Yeah. I think if uh, if the execution of the space stuff would have been better, like it's obvious they were like really constrained by some sort of uh, budget. Oh. Yeah. And it's like, I mean, if you think, if you took like a, like event horizon and that, that level of, uh, oh. you know, I don't know, set design, just art design period. And that would have been your space sequences in that movie. I don't think there would have been the issues. That's fair. That's a fair way of putting it. It was distracting, oh, okay. I guess, in some ways in this current form. Yeah. I mean, like other than, other I guess, I guess you know, like what he said and what, what I've said. I guess it's really it. It's jarring. Yeah. But uh, I love the time jumps, though. I love, yeah. you know, starting from, you know, the history of how the that's box right. was originally made to going through time. Like, that stuff I love. Yeah. I mean, honestly, I think the rest of it was fantastic. Um, yeah. Angelique is probably my favorite addition to the entire uh, 
movie though like i think that the character is just great and the idea that she's kind of almost like tethered to a human you know and have to do their will until it goes against hell's will yeah like, yeah that was a different something we hadn't seen before basically yeah yeah, a great, great call out with Angelique. I mean, you know, in addition to Valentina Vargas uh, being gorgeous, I think yeah. it was, um, you know, she had these almost different rules, right? I mean, she was kind of fighting at first with Pinhead, and it was like she was kind of a rogue, almost Cenobite in a lot of ways. Again, like even with the doctor and, you know, stuff, I'm like, is she actually, I wouldn't yeah, consider good, her a Cenobite, right? Good question, she, good question, good she's, point. She's a hell pr- they call her princess, so she, like, I'm assuming, like, whoever her father is, if it's lucifer or if they got a different leader of hell or it's a box or if it's if it's leviathan <laughs> just popped out a baby i don't that's know a good point. Like, like, popped out a baby yeah. yeah i mean that's a that's a good point i actually really not thought about that until we started having these conversations it's very true and i made the assumption because me, she's never been human like we're unlike right. cinnabites right right that's actually a really good point huh I just, yeah, you're right. I may have made the false assumption based on her look that she was that, but I actually, I think that's a really good point. I need, may I need to rewatch that mm-hmm. through that. I mean, I know that she was, again, to go back to this, I guess this is the third time in the first four movies where somebody's skin was basically, uh, yeah, you know, taken yeah. over. So, so yeah, it's a good point. Which, okay. which definitely is, is another thing. They were taking themes from part one and two. So I'm like, yes, that's why I like this one. <laughs> Yeah, I agree with you. I think going back to, you know, some of the the rules from the first two, I think were were definitely um and and the characters were more interesting. I thought the Cenobites that were created, right? Like the twins. Oh, and I that find were, that so interesting because Pinhead's like, I can hear your fears. Please don't separate me from my brother. That's and right. The, the irony of it, you know. <laughs> that's right. I agree with you. I think that was cool. And and I thought that the you know, the dog characters, uh, I think when I first saw them, I was like, dogs? But then I just realized that those were humans that were mm-hmm. and kind of all, turned into this. Uh, reminded me of Chatterer. Which yes, I love. Yeah. exactly. Yeah, so I think the dogs were, and, and again, they're, they're humans that appear to have been turned into these things. So I think yeah. that was kind of interesting in of itself. And I wonder about their backstories, or that backstory. I guess which there's I only one dog, right? Like with, with the Hellraiser movies in general, I think that, the fact we get so little about their backstories is is interesting because it makes you constantly think and ask those questions. That's right, exactly. No, that's a great point. And I guess I, I misspoke. I guess there's only one dog. I'm, I'm I think projecting. One. I was just one, right? I think so. Yeah, I'm projecting so. my Resident that's Evil uh, movie so. stuff with the multiple dogs. So yes, got it. <laughs> just one dog. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, um. I, I I don't know. I lost what I was saying whenever I was starting to talk. It happens to me. Uh, like the uh, the progression of uh, from generation to generation, just how much more gets added to what they're doing. Like because they're trying to uh, to basically figure out a way to undo what they did with the box originally. It's interesting That's to right. me, like this generational knowledge idea. Like each generation figures out something the last can't. So. That's, yeah. that's fascinating to me. Yeah, I agree. And I think it's interesting that was, I guess it was Le Merchant in the first one who made the box years, hundreds of years ago, and he changed his name, Americanized it, quote unquote, to uh, Merchant. And, you know, I think, but to your point, you have these, not only the knowledge of the box and how to add on what the previous generations has done, but just this sort of draw toward architecture, this draw toward this design. I just think it's an interesting thing. And I'm glad they had the same actor play the same, you know, these characters over time. And I also find interesting. it interesting that they just refer to to each of them as toy maker. Yes, exactly. That's pretty cool too as well. Yeah. I think it was, yeah, very, very fascinating. I did like the whole scene whenever they, turned uh angelique i mean into angelique is that character that was very kind of i don't know mystical but very dark and gory i just really liked that whole scene the way they did that okay gave me a very cult cultish vibe yes exactly right which jared knows i'm very big into cult movies (laughs) okay (laughs) which i'm gonna gonna bring this i've told this story before uh uh but not on this uh and uh, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and tell why I'm into that sort of thing. Like, uh, at, as a kid, like, I walked through woods and went, ran up on, like, some sort of weird cult, like, oh, ritual site. 
like with bones of animals nailed to to trees and all this stuff. So I've always had this fascination ever since that. Oh, interesting. How old were you when that happened? Uh, I'm not 100% sure, but I'm going to guess somewhere between six and eight. Wow. So it definitely had a impact on you at such a young age. Yeah. So it just fascinates me. What makes somebody get there? You know, right. Like, what, right. what makes somebody so weird that they're going to mutilate animals and nail them to trees and make these weird designs on the ground? I mean, because it's I, what causes that? Like, it's fascinating to me. Yeah, I mean, it's um, because of this. <laughs> all sorts of things, right? I mean, it's a sense of belonging. It's a sense of uh, share. Who knows? You know, it's a, it could be all sorts of reasons. But yeah, there's definitely sort of a stereotypical cultish type of feel to that. I also liked on, again, the guy, I, I can't remember his name, the, the guy that actually wanted all this to happen, how they had him have like sores on his face and things like that, which implied that obviously he was somebody who partook in all sorts of debauchery. Yeah. I, I really thought that was an extra extra sort of touch that they added on that as well. Oh, and uh, Adam McKay. Adam Scott. Yeah, same person. Adam McKay is the Adam director. Adam Scott. He's the Anchorman guy. I told y'all I'm bad with names. Like, this this is that... The, yeah. the, on, on the uh, previous episode, I messed up Floris Leachman's name, called her Doris Leachman. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, yeah. I'm glad you guys are both there to make sure you're on the right track. Yeah, so he, that's pretty much him calling me out the whole time because I'll mess up people's oh, names. Oh, <laughs> well, that's, it's all right. We were talking off the cuff. It's uh, it's okay. You're going to not remember everybody's name at every moment, so it's okay. Adam, it's not a bad thing. Adam Scott's been in a couple of Adam McKay movies, so, I mean, it's not too far off, I guess. Right, uh, right, exactly. <laughs> Exactly. Uh, but it's fascinating to see him in that uh, retroactively, you know, because like you're, you, he's yeah. a comedic actor and you see him in, uh, you know, this, this Hellraiser sequel. I guess it's kind of like, you know, seeing Matthew McConaughey in the Texas Chainsaw Massacre 4, or, you know, any of these mm-hmm. Jennifer Aniston in, in Leprechaun. Leprechaun and Leprechaun. kind of like, wow, this is not only playing against the type they would later build, but also That's r- just the oddity of seeing uh, someone who became, you know, a relatively big star in essentially a cast of lesser knowns. That's right. You know, yeah, exactly. I'm, I'm sorry to get very like random, but like, I was just thinking about it. If I became a Cinebite, I would probably end up being that camera head Cinebite. <laughs> in as stupid as he is. <laughs> I guess I, <laughs> well, I'm glad that you can relate that to that. No, I'm just that, saying because, like, I love movies and stuff. So no, I know. No, it makes, we'll see. Now you can appreciate No, I'll be a VCR center, but I'll just shoot out oh. VCR to be a new uh, like BuzzFeed quiz. What Cinebite will you be when you get to Harry? Yeah, and that's so, right. Uh, that's take actually... the place of, like, what Harry Potter house are you going to go into? <laughs> maybe there's some website or app that exists that somehow, you know, does a, you know, a filter that shows what you may be. At. Who knows? Maybe they, <laughs> if, if not, if not, maybe you can create it. So I don't know. We'll see. So. Um, so, Mark, uh, question. Have you seen any of the ones past four? Uh, I have, unfortunately. Uh, I think. Um, I, it, you know, uh, has it been traumatic? I think. <laughs> I, I think. It, well, I mean, I tried to watch them. I think you know. I, I, I'm sure. I'm sure you both know, and, and probably listeners know that in some of these cases, there were other scripts that were put together, yeah. and they're like. Well, I only watched two of them. Um, oh, which, okay. That was enough for me. I was like, I, I know I watched Hell World. I don't know what oh. the other one I watched was. That's it one with Lance funny. Hendrickson in it, right? Sure. I, 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 I don't know. I've kind of like blocked it from my memory. <laughs> Is that the one where they had the cults and the online yeah. online, uh, yeah, community, right? Yes. Yeah, there's uh, part five, uh, which had the guy that was the cop, that he was like a dirty cop. And um, oh, it's the guy from Nightbreed. I can't remember the, the, the actor's name, the, the main guy, but who yeah, played no, Boone. We already established. I'm not the person to ask. <laughs> no, okay. Okay, whatever. But I think the the only thing about that movie that was cool is they had the wire twins in it, which are those other Cenobites you may have seen before, which were kind of an interesting design. And they had a, like a half torso chatterer. So maybe, you know, uh, part but, six was the one. Go ahead. I, I definitely, I'm sorry if I cut you off, but I That's definitely right. do think that it's, they all suffered from what you said, that they took other scripts and just threw Cenobites and Pinhead into That's, them. That's right. Yeah. I mean, we don't need to recount all of them. I will say, I, you know, go ahead. Oh, no, I was agreeing with you. Yeah. I will say I did not mind the one with um, Paul Taylor in it, the one that was the most recent one they did. You know, they did two. What was they it did called? Two without, 
they did two i think it's uh judgment maybe okay i haven't seen that one so i might have to give that a shot yeah they did two without doug bradley and one of them was horrific the i can't remember the name of it the one they did first without doug bradley that he didn't want even attached to yeah the second one they did without doug bradley with paul taylor who i had the pleasure of working with actually on a a short film um i'm not just saying because i work with him was actually kind of interesting with the set design and just a different way of in the way the characters feel like a a hellraiser movie or did it feel like something packed with hellraiser tacked on it it felt it was definitely a hellraiser movie but they definitely had some interesting characters it's definitely very grime it was different than the others it felt more like a hellraiser movie than the others but they did some different they had like different i I mean i don't want to give it away but they just had like different weirdness in it that worked for the movie so i I, if you ever have time i'd I'd recommend i think you say it's the most recent one correct it's the most recent one obviously before the the newest one comes out but yeah the most recent one i think it's hellraiser judgment i believe is what it is are you getting excited about the new one i i mean yeah i mean i am to see what they do with it i mean what, what about you um, I'm excited about it, but at the same time, I love Doug Bradley. So it's like sort of right. that sort of situation. Um, I do, I do find it interesting that, um, cause like my memory, again, it's been a long time since I read Hellbound, but my memory of Hellbound was Pinhead being described female. And so I yeah, do I've... find it interesting that they're choosing a, uh, uh, trans, you know, actress right. to play that. So that, that's interesting. Yeah, I mean, I haven't read it, the book, as I mentioned, but I've heard that, you know, people saying that. So, you know, and maybe that's what they need to do. Maybe instead of trying to make another male pinhead and people compare him to Doug Bradley, they go a different route. And maybe that'll just be a different way of looking at it. Um, I, I know this is just me having wishful thinking, but like I would love it if there would be one final Doug Bradley one. And uh, uh, and even if you could possibly bring back Kirstie, like, oh, yeah, that, that to me would be like amazing. But like. Just wishful thinking on my part, which me the way my brain works, I'm coming up with ideas for it, but I'm like, ah. <laughs> yeah, that would, I mean, yeah, that would be, I mean, they often do these movies now, right, where they kind of bring back people that haven't been, I mean, obviously Halloween 2018, but, but you know, they often bring people back, so you never know. I will say one of the sequels, I think it was the sixth one, did have Kirsty in it, oh, did wow. have um, Ashley, uh, Ashley Lawrence, is that her name? Right, did yeah. you? Mm-hmm. Yeah, who, who, she actually is in it. Uh, and, and married to this this person. She's not in it a lot, but she's in it. So I'm, again, I'm not recommending watching Six. I think, again, they kept on pulling things from the past. But yeah, that would be an interesting final movie you're talking about. Actually, it's funny. The other night, like I had, because uh, I had uh, signed up for, what, I think it was Cinemax, so that I could watch yeah. the Hell, Hellraiser 3 and 4. And the other night I was flipping through and I saw those, you know, sequels. And I'm like, I might watch a couple. Then like, I thought about it for a second. I'm like, no, I'm not. <laughs> i mean listen there's only limited time and energy we can put toward any things and if you're watching a sequel that may not be great it's taken away from something else you can enjoy so staring at a wall or, yeah or, or right well, <laughs> right yeah have shoes. <laughs> right 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 exactly <laughs> i have not seen any of these movies so so is there anything about the you know one through four that we haven't said that it, anybody can think of to throw in there. I don't think we mentioned um, in the fourth one that uh, Pinhead was back to being more in character. Oh yeah, he was. Oh. he was very much so more in character, and uh, I love that he was a little bit more evil seeming in four than one and two, but still more yeah. Pinhead. And honestly, as like a, a non fan of the franchise, I actually think that was the most effective one because it's like I think it balanced out like you know the more matter of fact pinhead from the first two with i think where they wanted him to go which was right bigger more lack of a better term marketable yeah. uh, that the really over the top version in three kind of yes kind of really uh went against character to the point where fans of the first two like like you guys were like yeah no not this <laughs> Yeah, I think that's a great call out. Yeah, the, the pinhead in part four. Yeah, you described it perfectly. I agree. Um, yeah, I mean, beyond that, I, you know, I don't think I have anything to add uh, based, you know, beyond what we've talked about already on this okay. on the franchise. Well, Mark, I told you uh, before we started recording this that I always want to ask if anybody has any interesting <laughs> true Hollywood stories. Don't have to be in Hollywood. Can be celebrity story. Could be 
encounter with a filmmaker it could be anything like that do you have anything yeah. you'd like to share yeah yeah thanks for asking about that yeah i mean i think at least one story i can share was i had an opportunity uh late 2020, I believe, to work on set uh, with uh, director, performer, you know, writer Stormy Daniels, uh, and she was directing this film. And long story short, uh, this is an opportunity for her, you know, to step in and take over the as the director of this film, which is it's a it's a, it's a slasher type film, right? Oh, okay. So um, I had an opportunity to work with her. And I said, you know, I said, hey, so how do you feel about, you know, this being your directorial debut? And then she just, without missing a beat, reminded me that she's actually directed about 80 plus films. And this is not <laughs> her directorial debut. And so I was like, oh, yeah. But it was just it was just kind of like a, a moment where, um, you know, and again, I want to say, like, I will say out of all the directors I've worked with, I definitely think that she was extremely effective. Like she oh, was I she was uh, in the scenes that I did. You know, she affirmed the things that I did positively, and then she made recommendations on how to improve it. So I have to say, I, I, and I know, um, you know, in working, as you know, yourself with directors, there's some directors that are like, no, do it this way, this way, this way. And there's other directors like, that eh, was great. And I'm like, really? That was great? So I just, I, <laughs> she did a perfect balance of, you know, collaboration, but also saying, here's what I want out of it. And it felt, made me feel better. Um, and I imagine, and I'm speculating that perhaps because she's directed many, many, many other people in very compromising positions, that she had to be that type of person who is yeah. very sensitive to people in 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 those things. So, but anyways, it's it's, it's a pleasure. It was a pleasure to work with her, and um, I was just, uh, yeah. There's a lot of stereotypes about her, I'm sure, but she was like amazing to work with as a director. That sounds pretty awesome. Um, what, was yeah. the, what was the name of the movie? Uh, it was. Uh, axe to grind um it's it's, that's out there on imdb so it's not like i'm sharing anything that was uh, which is part two of the original axe to grind starring debbie rashawn if you've ever seen that uh where she's a an aging yeah actually the first axe to grind uh was debbie rashawn as this sort of aging screen queen whose husband is cheating on her with his young model um and they're filming this other slasher film in the sanitarium with all these young models and she basically goes crazy and, and hacks everybody up. That's the original one. The second one, again, I don't want to reveal too much. Um, we were filming for a while and they're actually just starting to refilm again now. So, and it's Axe with a two grind in it. Oh, so I, I got to check it out. Grind. Two Axe, two grind. Yeah. 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 But for the first, yeah, I, I, I really like the first one. I'm a huge Debbie Rashawn fan. Um, mm -hmm. So I really uh, enjoyed the first one. I'd recommend watching it. Okay. Uh, yeah. I'm going to check it out. Like I, I, I pretty much watch anything anyway. This one, well, there you go. Sequels. <laughs> yes, I'd recommend watching that definitely over any of the Hellraiser sequels. <laughs> and then you can watch Hellraiser Judgment because I feel like well, that is at least worth checking out. Well, I, I got to ask you, like now that I'm thinking about it. So you come in as an outsider from the uh, from the film industry and in getting into it. How, what is your uh opinion on acting like how do you like acting like do you love it or do you <laughs> yeah great great, you great question those are only two answers it's good or bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so a couple of things um one it's much 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 more difficult than it looks yeah uh two you know i think my role in my my life in healthcare has been about getting patients and others to sort of open up and then listening to what they're saying and then responding right and then sort of guiding the conversation yeah um which is great right because acting is about responding but the difference is you're, there's a script yeah so my biggest challenge is how do i remain on the script and still make it natural and i'm sure a lot of actors experience that um is, well it, it it depends on uh for for me, looking at it, it depends on who the person directing is. Do they want you to be one hundred percent on script, or do they mind you making it feel more natural? Good point. Yes. Which and and, and uh, Brian and I uh, both come from uh, the same type of acting background. Yeah, which, uh, the Hagen method. Which kind of uh, his question to you kind of made me uh, interested in hearing your your response because I mean, somebody coming from you know psychology and everything and and that approach to acting is pretty much the method, you know, for the psychological roots 
of your team. Right. That, that's pretty much what Uda, Uda Hagen is. Yeah, I think it's 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 in, yeah, it's interesting. So so what I what I do, like for instance, if I'm going to talk to a patient, right, and let's just say they're not managing their diabetes well. And my goal is to try to guide them to a point where they feel more comfortable doing that. Mm -hmm. And I'm talking to them and then let's say, you know, that was the plan, but I'm talking to them and they say, hey, you know what? I can't even think about that right now because I just got kicked out of my house and I have nowhere to live. Well, guess what? The conversation is going to go in an entirely different place. Mm -hmm. So I think, so I have to be able to respond and listen. And my idea of focusing on managing their diabetes goes somewhere different. So that's my challenge because with the script, you still got to follow the path where you're going to originally yeah. go on. So I think for me personally, that's been my biggest challenge, but I agree with you. Uh, there's been some great people that directors have worked with um, who have been said, Hey, here's where I wanted you to end up in the end. How you get there is up to you. And I really enjoyed those parts mm -hmm. of being able to do that. Well, I, I know like coming from both the acting and the directing side, like to me, I've, I've noticed that different actors like uh, either if they're like me, they prefer to be just let go and do what they would like to do and maybe just slightly steered. And then there's others that want to be hands-on directed. And like, it's interesting seeing the, the difference. Right. Like yeah. Me, exactly. I feel like I'm a force of nature that just needs to be let go and just keep <laughs> me from just destroying something. Just get him to yell a lot. It's great. <laughs> yeah. I think, yeah, I think that's, that's a great, that's a great point. Yeah, I, I agree. I think there's, it goes back to what I said earlier, right? You don't want somebody to be so wishy-washy and say, yeah, it was great. And somebody to be so concrete, say it this way, do this or whatever. So, so I agree. Um, have you ever given any uh, thought to possibly getting on the other side of things and trying to direct anything? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I don't know. I mean, it seems very interesting. I'm actually finding myself enjoying participating in some writing in certain areas. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. I think it'd be. I think it'd be. It'd be interesting, especially when it comes to character motivation and trying to figure that out. Well, I mean, that's essentially what writing is: you know, character motivation. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's true. Yes. Yeah. In my in my life in my life in health, well, I, the, the character motivation leads the plot like half the time. Yeah, in my opinion. Yeah. That's a good point, right? Right. It's it, you know in my my healthcare life, uh, you know, my colleague and I call her out on every podcast I do. Uh, she's a nurse I've worked with for quite some time. Her name is Brittany Wilson. Mm -hmm. She and I have done, and we actually have, we were hired to do a series of trainings for a healthcare educational online company, where we did we acted out pretending to be a patient and a physician or a patient and nurse mm -hmm. or, or whatever, and we sort of ad lib but also know where we were going and it was just sort of we had to create these scenarios so it's not the same as obviously directing what you're talking about but we still had to create these different scenarios and kind of direct ourselves yeah i mean like to, to me all of that sort of creative stuff is just so much fun like which is why i do both sides of it like i, I love i can see that. that yeah i can um, definitely see it. that's that's really cool that you've been able to do that both of you have been able to sort of and him, just really he's, he's done both sides of it as well yeah a little yeah bit. He's he's like way more on the acting writing side, but he's the regular too. That exactly, I think that makes a lot of sense, and it seems like a natural uh, connection if you're creative. So I give you both credit for doing this because it's and not an easy a industry. A lot of my ideas, he'll help out with uh, the stories on them too. Like we'll be me and him just bouncing ideas back and forth, and like, that's great. Yeah. Well, it's great to have somebody do that, right? So you're not in a vacuum. And I think it's great to work on a creative process with somebody you trust. So um, kudos to both of you for doing that and also for doing the podcast because clearly this is a passion project of yours as well. Yeah, I mean, like I, I, I legitimately, like I was thinking, I'm like, man, I would love to go on a podcast. Man, I'd love to go on a podcast. I'm like, why don't we just make our own? Right. <laughs> and he, he was like, I'll do a podcast. He's like, sure, let's do that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we didn't know what we were wanting it to be. I mean, I knew I wanted to own movies. At first, I was wanting it to be just horror movies. And then I'm like, but I want to talk about this movie. But I want to talk about yeah. that movie that's not horror. And I'm like, oh, it's, it's just, and and like, I'm like, was like, so, so do I do like cult movies or whatever? And then we decided any movie we want. And yeah. like, uh, and then when we're trying to come up with names, was it you that shot out the fucking movie podcast? No, it wasn't. That was <laughs> you. Was it me? Because I, I, I just remembered having the hardest night. No, I, I was like, let's stick with Cinema Rewind. That sounds oh, good. Oh, maybe I was just getting mad. I'm like, oh, let's just call it the fucking movie podcast. <laughs> and hence, a great name was created. I think that's that's fantastic. I would have named it something else entirely. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
And I think that, you know, I think that you're talking about like a filter, right? You sort of have these broad ideas and you keep filtering it down. And I think as time goes on with everyone, I think every one you do, it'll get uh, more and more, you know, refined. So it's part of the process. Well, uh, Mark, I'm going to go ahead and start uh, wrapping this up, but feel free to stay on the line and talk afterward. Um, sure. But uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, tuning in. Uh, we uh, hope you watch the next episode. We're going to have uh, Lydia Manson talking about Beetlejuice. And uh, thank you again, Mark, for being on here. And for everybody, uh, have a good one. Yes.